the quayside. As dark as it's going to get. Hatchbacks are gathered like the closing frames of snooker. Girls giggle in harmony with the odd nocturnal seagull. And headlamps are a form of winking from a distance. Hot box or hand jobs or simply passing time. The juvenile adrenaline that comes with petty crime. Too young or too broke to try and chance it in the bars. So Friday's misdemeanours come in neon coloured cars. This is where Maria met Steve. She was 17, he was 23. A Kermit coloured Cleo on a double date with Kirsty. It's funny how, the more you drink, the more it makes you thirsty. Five years and a fortnight since he drove her back to his. He promised her something special, but she's yet to discover what it is. So, she plans to just let her hair grow for a bit. Use a £20 note as a bookmark in her Sylvia Plath. Let Stephen paint her toenails as he watches Match of the Day and then stretch out in a Pikachu onesie. He makes the greatest brew on earth, that boy. Two sugars and the shade of orangutan whiskers. They have to swim the channel just to try and pay the rent. A fortnight with a microscope and every penny spent before they plummet with a pressure and it's plundered by a drug. A spliff instead of breakfast or red wine from a mug. But with phones stuck in flight mode and the doors double locked. There's nothing in the world beats the comfort of this bubble. And as Netflix babysits for bits that drag and drift between the shifts, her eyes evade the calendar and all she's ever dreamt of. Because it's easier to compromise than pursue. It's easier to accept than to challenge. It's easier to recalibrate than to truly stick to your guns. The last time she checked, there was no parachute button on the Virgin TiVo remote. So, she plans to just... Let her hair grow for a bit and fall asleep with Sylvia singing lullabies from the page. Good evening, everybody. My name is Matt Abbott. Welcome to the 41st Insta session. Um, I'm very excited, as always, about tonight's uh, guest, which is Liam Xavier. Uh, so Liam is a British Caribbean writer, theatre maker and producer based in London. Uh, his second collection of poetry, Welcome to Hell, was released in June 2020 and was an Amazon bestseller. And he's currently writing his third book, How Love Begins, which is due for release, uh, due for publication in September. So I shall invite for himself. That makes it sound like he's done something wrong. Obviously, he hasn't. Um, see what he has to share with us. Here we go. Hi, mate. How are yeah. you doing? I'm good, thanks. My, I've got a bit of delay on this. I wasn't, I wasn't quite ready for that. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, no. Uh, I'm hoping my internet will, will keep alive for this <laughs> looks good so far have you had a good day Brilliant. i have yeah it's not been too bad um work wasn't too busy so I sort of yeah kept calm <laughs> good as yours it seems like people have been thrown in a deep end in a lot of jobs like retail and hospitality do you gone from nothing to being dead like crazy so that's good if it was chilled yeah absolutely i mean i work in um sort of corporate uh, videography and it's gone mad as well but yeah it's on and off. <laughs> good, good, good. Oh, that's all right then. Um, so how's the third book coming along? Is that, I guess if it's due in September, it must be nearly finished-ish? Yeah, it's, it's going well. It's exciting because um, I feel like I was saying to my friend the other day that it's the first book I've started to write that doesn't feel like I have to go through utter pain to write it because it's a more positive one. The first right. two were you know, more about mental health and the, the sadder things in life. But uh, this book is about, you know, reflection on, on things about love. So it's, it's a nice, it's a, more of a pleasure. <laughs> well, I guess, yeah, welcome to hell. And then how love begins. <laughs> Two different stories. <laughs> <laughs> it's a change. <laughs> so um, why was that? Do you think was that, did that just naturally occur? Or did you just feel like you needed to shake it up? Or I mean, it was... I've been writing this particular book for the length of time that I've written the other two. Yeah. They've all happened at the same time. Oh, okay. Interesting. But, yeah, but I, I never felt like it was the right time for it. And I never felt like I was in the place where I could write a whole positive book about, you know, happiness and loving life and loving people and uh, believe in it. So I, I wanted to get to a point where I just felt a lot better in myself and now it's it's a really nice time where even if I'm struggling I have a better understanding of life now so it felt like a right time. Nice. 
So what, as in you were writing three collections almost parallel? Um, essentially, well, yeah, because I'm very, uh, it's probably annoying as a writer to do this, but I write several projects at a time constantly. Yeah. Because then if I get bored of things very quickly. So if I'm writing one thing and I say, oh, I can't bother to finish this, I want to do something else now. Um, then I have something to fall back on. Yeah. And it means that if, if I'm more passionate about mental health at one point and, you know, it's all that's sort of taking up my time, then I can finish that project. And it's, I guess it's, I'm always writing. I write every day. So there's themes and I just pick out from those themes yeah. um, different projects. That's, that's interesting. That's, I really admire that because that takes a lot of discipline rather than trying to cram them all into one big fat book. You've gone, no, actually, these are separate books. Like, having that discipline from the outset, I really admire that. I've tried that before. Well, I didn't try it. I, it's it was what I originally went to do when I did the first book. Yeah, and it just doesn't flow right when you try and shove everything into one book. So you have to have some sort of patience and be like, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll wait. Fair play, fair play. So when you say um, you were writing them alongside each other, how long was that period of time that you were writing them? Do you reckon? Um. Well, the first one came out. I think must have been. Uh, 2018 now and I think I've been writing them since probably 2016 on right. and off I mean there's new poems in there yeah but of course, but... the, the older ones yeah yeah wow interesting so this is so this is taking a different direction and it's due out in September so is it almost like a triptych like three sort of exist like as a little mini series do you think yeah I guess so because even with my account here I've always tried to be transparent about what the writing journey is and what life is about you're not I, do, I don't ever want to put out a book that's entirely positive and never put out the negative ones yeah yeah because i like people being able to see that journey whether that's my first book having some poems that i'm not completely hot on anymore um you know i, I really enjoy that fair play yeah i like that it's yeah a lot of people sort of feel like they can't let down the wall but i guess it's very important to do so and obviously the way you write is very open like, and, mm. you know, you, you show your vulnerability. And I, that's just more and more important nowadays, isn't it, I suppose? Fair play. Well, yeah. do you want to be sharing a poem? Yeah, sure. So cool. um, the first one, I haven't decided yet whether this is going in the third one or not. Um, but it is more lovely. And I feel like it's a, uh, I've tried to be a positive spin on something that was quite difficult. Cool. <clears throat> I remember being a child picking petals off of daffodils' heads and hoping when I reached the last, I would smile and say she loves me. And then I wasn't a child anymore. And it wasn't daffodil petals, but your sunflower speech that sank me. And I smiled and said, I love her. I have been searching the nibs of my pens to find a way to write of us, but how do you translate something that was already living poetry? And so I stopped asking the ink and began to pick apart the pieces of my heart that much like the petals had been ripped to the side, deciding if love was real or not. And they came together and a puzzle of past and spelt this song. You were not a drug, nor magic. You were the organ that kept me alive. I am not religious, but I saw the pride of God in you. I hung on your words like to miss a second was a tragedy, and I searched your eyes for the way they glared into mine and heard as my chest imploded with the weight of such almighty beating. I cannot fathom the feeling in retrospect, so overwhelming and enormous. You were the war and the flag of surrender. You were the words that once they have fallen out of the mouth, leave it feeling empty. Anything I do feels like nothing but a shadow to such sensation, and perhaps the collapse of such intense fire is inevitable. But I know that love is an undefined thing, and even if I find someone who replaces the state of being you placed me in, there will always be the tattoo of every mark you left. And I guess it is because ours was a chemistry that lit a flame without ever connecting. It was science that saw me stuck to your soul, and I believe whatever happened in between our two lost atoms, we were meant to be for a time in life. And we were, of some sort, a duo to be decorated. And so, though I still don't know what to call you and still get the urge to call you, 
and know if I were to ever see you again, I would fly back in time to when I could hear your voice without my chest shattering like a window after too many rocks thrown at its face. I will watch our boat float down the river, two hearts that did not know how to hold each other. And I will wave goodbye with just a single tear, knowing our time was here and then was gone, and that for some, that is all that was meant to be. And I can see that now. As much as it tears me apart, I can finally start again, and when someone arrives with an outstretched hand, I will not turn them away. In fear of the end, I will welcome them, show them around the walls of this crumbling house, and let life do what it must. For better, for worse, I will always be grateful for the time spent and the lessons learnt with you. Nothing has ever thrilled me, nor broken me quite like it. Beautiful. Very nice. Thank you. I think it should Thank go you. in the book. <laughs> well, it's sort of, I think um, the situation that was about is um, my perspective has changed on things over the time and that's sort of what inspired that book now is the idea of that things can happen but you have a, a better way of, of looking at it now. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's, um, yeah, I guess that's difficult for you when because you know something that was really really bad at the time even though your perspective changed it's like yeah but that's how i felt then and recognizing that these yeah. sort of snapshots and think, oh but i've changed yeah yeah but I, I think i think that's beautiful i think that's really great and uh thank patrizia, you. patrizia said that was beautiful as well um she's oh, thank you so, much. so yeah cracking yeah nice one <laughs> um so do you gig a lot in london do you do you find the opportunity to do spoken word nights i know you do theater as well but I haven't done enough, really. Um, I've only lived in London for about two and a half years now. Right. Um, I, I'm from Essex, and um, one night I just went and did a gig in a culture in Essex, and it was great, and I sort of got the, the bug for it, but I, I've always had that nervousness for a new thing. So yeah. I was used to acting more than anything before. Right. So when I was then bringing my poetry to a spoken word audience... I was so nervous. So to think of bringing that to London was terrifying. Um, yeah. So most of the sort of gigging stuff has been over Zoom and online now because just when uh -huh. I got that time to gig, um, everything started yeah. shutting. <laughs> That's even harder, to be honest. I, I mean, t to be fair, like, are you from near Colchester-ish? Oh, no. Please come back. Got the little white spinny circle. Ah! Oh yeah, I so I oh, sorry I lost you for a second. Then um, are you near, are you from near Colchester? Um, I'm from Malden, which is near Chelmsford. I don't know how right. many people know Malden, but I, I mean I've heard of it. I know Chelmsford, like, but um, okay. I mean, to be honest, in my experience, London audiences are very patient and very open-minded and very forgiving. To be fair, like, uh, there's some great nights in there, like at Rich Mix and all that, and. Hmm. Anyways, well, no, I'm just curious. I'm just curious because I've only just left London, and I've not. Oh, like, really? Yeah, I was there for about four years, but um, I mean, I wasn't that involved in the scene really. But yeah, I was just curious. That's all. And like you yeah. said, doing it all online, it's it's totally different kettle of fish, isn't it? Yeah, there's a great community there, so I'm really excited to get out into the London scene. Yeah, definitely. The Betsy Trotwood is the poetry heart of London. It's a pub in Farringdon. It's just 10 oh wow. 10. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, sorry, I should stop waffling. Um, do you fancy sharing us another poem? Sure. Um, the next one I've, I've got is um, a lot of my friends are either actors or musicians, so sometimes we work together. Um, and this poem was originally alongside music, but I'm just sure. gonna, I think it works with that as well. Lose the mind. Aligned, the time will find its way to you. Trust in a pace of gracious fate, the state of your audacious greatness. Make the most of your dose of coastal calm. Ghosts of past will never pass till you grasp hold of your cold gasp of fast fear. Each morning brings the daunting things of life, but love will leave the light to guide your blinded eyes. You try and try beside the gliding prideful, but die inside until the next revival. Pick up your head. This is your best recital yet. Alone is not a word that deserves to be heard from you. You are too rich in latent radiance. Be patient and wait for the gradient changes coming. 
Some things never last, depart too fast, but the past, the task, you fill the flask and drink the past like it burns the tongue but warms the throat, that simple cold of comfort. Freeze the fun but sees the pain to change the rain that bathes away its wasteful strain. This life is random, in tandem also with planned precision, precisely perfect, it's worth it just to birth a new feeling. Come rest at ease beneath the silent trees, sedate the violence of your tireless tyrant mind. My goodness, goodness comes to those who suppose the world is more than this. Those who close their eyes open to surprise survival. Arise, dear friend, and lend your ears to the sheer scope of life and ditch the fears of sudden strife. Uncertainty is the only certain absurdity that eternally turns us to fervently frightened, but there is mightiness in the quietness. For it is when we hear our wings and take flight. Nice. Wow, that was brilliant. So different <laughs> to the first one. I love the musicality was fantastic. I know you said you performed it with musicians, but yeah, that's what I love about poetry. Great. That needs to be heard in a yeah. room full of people. That needs to that needs <laughs> that'll just build and build and build. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. I'd love to do that one in, 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 in with an audience. Um, but yeah, I think poetry is so naturally attuned to music that it's it's lovely when you can bring the two together. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I personally got into lyrics a lot. Uh, I was obsessed with lyrics before poetry, and I've sort of obviously joined the dots now. But yeah, no, I've, and I, I, I guess working with musicians first and then doing it naked, as it will, it's sort of like... Uh, then changes how you're going to write poetry, doesn't it? Like it informs it mm. in a different way. And yeah, so it's so obviously you write theatre and you yeah. work with musicians and you write poetry. Like which which one was you? Which one came first? Uh, probably theatre as a as as a love, because I started poetry and theatre around the same time. Poetry was a recommendation by a therapist I had as a child. Okay. So that was probably around about. I uh, started writing poetry about eight eight years old right. um, and then I started acting for an amateur dramatics theatre company um, from 11 but I really got into theatre as a love and just expressing yourself in a different way playing different people and just getting into a different world it was so exciting um, and I'd, so that was definitely first and then poetry sort of came after university yeah in more of a social political context yeah, 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 I get that. Where did you go to uni, out of interest? At University of Essex in Colchester. Oh, nice. Yeah, cool, cool. Yeah, which, which was really great as well because it's a, it's a very liberal university, so I, I was introduced to things that um, I didn't understand at first or that I wanted to know about, but yeah. I'm from a conservative town, <laughs> I didn't know much about. Colchester Arts Centre is such a great venue as well, like... Mm. Anthony Wonderful. and all that. Yeah, they're great people. Yeah, Colchester, I mean, I've only done one or two things in Colchester, but it does seem like it's got a good art scene. Yeah, absolutely. The There's background. a lot of people there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, so you write a lot about, uh, obviously, mental well-being and, like, mm. uh, you know, the journey into adulthood and stuff like that. So you touched then on the, like, social and political stuff. Is that something you've always written about as well, or is that something that you're maybe finding, you, like, writing your way into, or...? Uh, I think it, I think it started in university yeah. because before then I always had a frustration about a lot of things, um, mainly around gender inequality and, and racism. They there was so much frustration, but I didn't know how to vocalise that. I didn't know how to find the evidence or the research. And then university was entirely that. And I did um, a module in literature where we studied, you know, the Caribbean. Um, perspective from america and that opened a whole box of tricks and things where um, i just started writing politically and how i really got into spoken word was a um response to a shooting in america and then from there people enjoyed it so i just carried on writing right yeah right fair enough i say it's always interesting to know what like obviously you started writing it when you're eight what what the moment was that brought it straight back to the fore and obviously that's tr uh, a tragic event but it's just it's just interesting to know how at different stages in your life it sort of does that i guess but um you're obviously on a very exciting poetic journey now so i guess it's here to stay <laughs> well i'm certainly hoping so I, I 
when when I was thinking of what to give you as like a bio, I never really know what to say yeah. because you you don't want to reduce yourself to too much, but at the same time, you are um, this this as a main thing. Yeah. Whether you're you know filmmaker, everything else beside that. <laughs> I know, it is tough sometimes, it is tough sometimes. But like, if you've had an Amazon bestseller poetry book, I think you can safely say you're a poet. <laughs> I think that's all right. <laughs> um, well, it's, it's pretty much 10 to, so if you've got any that you definitely want to share, now's the time to, to get them out. Yeah, um, before I choose the next one, can I just double check, um, is there any problems with swearing? or? No, no, crack mm-hmm. on. Say what you, say what you okay, want. So, <laughs> I was trying to do a mixture of poems and nice. talking about political. This one was around about social expectations. <clears throat> bus rides to school often offered mint hub bugs by some overly social stranger best friends for life promised in a tight packed or bracelet a trip to the chip shop at lunchtime chewy fried egg sweets and smarties brought with any small change found between the sofa's sides just a small snapshot of my british adolescence defined by countryside living But more than the normal routines, the niche habits of me and my friends, we were all conditioned to believe specific things. We were taught to believe we had to be a certain way. We had to go at a certain pace. Virginity lost by 18, the key to the house at 21, engaged or married at 24, and at least a baby by 26. As men, we could not be frigid or rigid with our masculinity. We had to fight and fuck like a stud. As women, they could not be promiscuous or passionate. They had to study and socialize in moderation, unlike the sluts. Toxic systemic conditions we did not realize we were living under the influence of. Let me break it down and list the truths for the youth still unaware. Sex is not as black and white as it is made to be. Virginity is not a shameful thing, it is a concept. Loving sex and having a lot of it is not a shameful thing either. Whatever your preference, whatever your pace, whatever your pleasure, if no one is hurt and everything is consensual, it is what you make it. Timing is subjective. Do things when they are comfortable for you. Plan your life or don't. Be 27 and have nothing structured so long as you are happy. Be 35 with no kids and no marriage and no care in the world. Be 20 with a good job, but less of a social life, and be proud of your choice. Be 56 and change your entire life with no regrets. Be you. Tolerance is mandatory. Understand the people around you. Learn what you were never taught. Talk to people you do not comprehend. Do not be the stubborn one that shouts abuse without context. Be kind to others and to yourself. And do not live under the pressure of anyone else's timing. <clears throat> Great. Very powerful. I like that a lot. Yeah. Thank you. It's a slightly different one to the style of, of, of a lot of the ones I write, even when I do political ones. But it was, um, I think my niece was born around the time that I wrote that one. And I was sort of thinking of what I would tell people that were younger than me, um, yeah. and potentially under that influence still. It's crazy how much we sort of brainwashed into following certain paths and meeting certain expectations and playing certain roles in it, definitely. Yeah, it's, 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 it's mad, especially with locations as well. Like I said, um, Malden is a very small town. It's almost entirely conservative and yeah. almost entirely white middle class. So <laughs> there's, yeah. you, you're taught a lot. Um, and life, I think, is about unlearning a lot of it. Totally. Yeah, yeah, totally. Life is about unlearning, definitely. Um, and yeah, it's, it's weird how you just, for you, that's just w- the whole world, isn't it? And like, I'm from Wakefield, mm-hmm. which is, uh, well, the town I grew up in, Osset, is 98% white British, predominantly working class. And just the more, as you start to travel and you're like, oh shit, like, and just, yeah, <laughs> you so blinkered, aren't you? It's, yeah, I think that's a really important poem. That's a really, really valuable poem to share. Thank you for that. Appreciate that. No, thank you for letting me um, perform. Well, if you've, I mean, it's uh, it's nearly five two. I reckon you've got time for another one. But um, yeah, have you got any? Have you got any projects in the pipeline, or do you just want to get this book out in September and sort of like reassess? <laughs> or um, well, no, the book is coming out, and then the theatre that I have with my friend Lauren, um, we're hoping to get something out there in person, hoping oh. to finally 
um, open up the performances because we, we started already and uh, we did the read throughs over Zoom and we did castings. We were ready to go and then lockdown happened and we had to completely change our ideas. Um, and now the theatres are opening, but obviously there's a massive backlog. So we're sort of like finding a way out of that. So at some point, um, our theatre, Wilson Theatre, will um, rise up <laughs> from the, the quiet. Yeah, well, fair play. Sounds exciting. Mm. Can you even have you? Can you even begin to imagine being at Edinburgh Fringe? <laughs> can you even contemplate standing on the Royal Mile with a flyer and like a million? Like I just can't. I can't get made around it. <laughs> it's crazy. I, I mean, I was. Um, I got into the, the the last play I went to was I think Sleepless in Seattle, and it was at the Wembley Troubadour, and it was reduced seating, and even that was really really strange because you couldn't see that you were you had two seats in between you and it just didn't feel quite right so yeah the idea of being in a, a packed place again and, and watching theatre is thrilling and, ex- and terrifying at the same time totally much like performing poetry um yeah <laughs> great well if, if you're happy to i'd love to hear one more if, if, if you're happy to yeah cool sure um the next one i uh, called coffee shop conversations um, <clears throat> a touch of civilization A brush with the world, connection in contact between others othered by us. The silent ones in the corner with a laptop and a coffee, maybe a notebook and a hot chocolate, maybe alone and nervous. The quiet rebel with little left to lose. The one that enters society hating it but wanting to be a part of it, partially believing it is a cure for its own sins. We are zoned in our own world, in a bubble created by others, sustained by us. Welcome to our mixed up misanthropy, which is really just a cover for being afraid of rejection, or maybe worse, acceptance. We scan the room, maybe stare a little long at the barista with the smile, but withdraw whenever someone sits near us. A perfect contradiction, a broken restriction detailed in the wrong conversation or in fervent miscommunication, we are here to change. It just takes time, doesn't it? A few break time distances, discovering new instances of humanity, screamed profanity when another lover leaves. This is us, broken and imperfect, searching for what's worth it, breaking our own rules and defining our own signs to take the time to notice, but This is us, coffee shop observers in love with the world we are so nervous of, in love with the way love looks in public when people aren't even trying, in confusion with it all, learning and observing to encourage our own hearts to join in with the chaos. Beautiful. (laughs) Great. Thank you. (laughs) Some great, really great lines in there. Yeah, some really great lines in there. Yeah, it's one of those ones that um, I spent so much time because I used to work in retail in in a shoe shop um, for two and a half years, and it's just a mad place to be in retail. So, in my lunch breaks, I used to go sit in Starbucks or or Cafe Nero and just write things. And there's such an atmosphere um, that you pick up when you're when you're actually observing oh, what's yeah. going on in, in those places. Yeah, absolutely. It's, as a poet, it's gold dust, isn't it? Just sitting somewhere mm. and writing. Like, I can't wait to just sit and write in a cafe all day again. Or a pub, but that tends to be that's limited. Yeah, I used to write in a pub as well after after work. Um, and people never understood it because it's so noisy. But there was something about the noise that also contributed. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Oh, Patrizia, this half hour made me made miss live poetry. Can't wait. And thank you, guys. Oh, thanks, Patrizia. That's very kind. <laughs> Um, yeah, it. no, I've, I've really enjoyed your set tonight. Thank you very much. So, um, the third one, uh, the third book mm-hmm. that's out in September, uh, How Love Begins, um, is it on pre-order yet or should it be on pre-order soon? No, um, I haven't set up pre-orders yet. I think um, I, I did it, the last one I did pre-orders about a month before right. and I think it, it worked quite nicely because I'm always, when, when everything is your control you know when you're self-publishing yeah um it's just a nervous plane to be on so i i don't want to you know pre-order three months before and then everyone forgets about the book a, a month yeah. later but so it'll probably be august i reckon 
cool. And it's uh, a, 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 a straight through Amazon, is it? Or do you have your own like big cartel site where we can get the other two? Or it will be so um, it'll be the same as the second book, and it will be through um, the major partners of Ingram. So it will be Amazon, Waterstones, Barnes and Noble. Oh, great! Um, cool. All those sort of things. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, we'll keep an eye out for that. I'm sure you'll share loads of links. If anybody watching do, doesn't follow Liam already, it's Liam Xavier writes. Liam Xavier ninety five on Twitter. Is that right? Yes, it is. Cool, brilliant. I'm terrible at Twitter, but I need to get better. <laughs> oh, look, it's great. As long as you're on one of them, it's fine. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you, mate. Enjoy the rest of your day, and uh, hopefully I'll see you on stage at some point. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks cool. for having me. Thank you. Da -da. Da -da. That was uh, the wonderful Liam Xavier. Uh, really enjoyed uh, what he shared tonight. He's got uh, two collections already out. Uh, the most recent one, Welcome to Hell, was an Amazon bestseller, and the third one, as we just said, is out in September. Um, so, yeah, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, my name is Matt Abbott. I'm back next week with the wonderful Kat Hepburn, who's got a brand new collection out on Burning Eye Books. Same time, same place. I'll see you then. Thank you very much. Have a good night.